Donation after circulatory death or DCD. In this video, we will explore the process of DCD organ donation through a 10 step process. Step 1 Decision of futility of treatment. The critical trigger in the DCD process is a decision that continuing life sustaining treatment is no longer in the patient's best interest and therefore should be discontinued. All DCD guidelines recommend that the decision to withdraw the cardiorespiratory support should always be independent and made before any consideration of organ donation. This decision then needs to be communicated and then understood and accepted by the potential donor's family prior to the subject of organ donation being raised. No member of the transplant or organ donation team should be involved in the decision making around the withdrawal of treatment. Although in the UK, SNORTS will be involved at a later stage to support the family through the donation consent process. Step 2. Family approach and consent for organ donation. Discussions about organ donation should only occur once the potential donor's family have accepted the withdrawal of active medical treatment. The governing bodies in the UK advocates that initial discussions with the family about the potential for organ donation should involve the specialist nurse for organ donation or SNORTS. However, this is not always possible, in which case preliminary discussions may be undertaken by the members of the referring hospital intensive care team. It cannot be emphasized enough how important the input of a SNORT both in communication with the family and also in ensuring that the entire process is properly coordinated. In the UK, the NHS organ donor register should be checked prior to approaching the family for consent. This may help to inform them about the views of the patient, but organ donation will not proceed without the consent of the family. Step 3. Donor Assessment and Characterization the SNORTS will assess the potential donor's suitability in general and the suitability of individual organs. This will include a detailed review of the individual organ function and an assessment of the current admission and past medical and social history. This information is gained by reviewing the medical documentation, performing a physical assessment, interviewing the donor's next of kin, and completing an extensive medical questionnaire with the donor's general practitioner. Tests such as detailed microbiology and an HLA typing is also completed at this stage. Step 4. Organ Offering and Allocation The allocation of the organs to be donated is a lengthy process, focusing upon recipient's prioritization, safety, and organ suitability. Once the donor organs have been allocated, the SNORTS will arrange a vacant theatre in the donor hospital and will mobilise the organ retrieval team. Step 5. The management of the patient before the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Supportive care should be continued in the period between considering organ donation and the actual withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Escalation of treatment to facilitate organ donation is an area of controversy. Guidelines recommend that interventions that may facilitate donation if they do not cause the patient harm or distress. This may include increasing ways of active drug infusions, increasing ventilatory support and inserting intravenous lines, but all proposed interventions should be carefully considered. Step 6. Timing of the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Treatment withdrawal is delayed until a retrieval team has travelled to the donating hospital and made their necessary preparations in theatre. It is vital that those responsible for organ allocation and retrieval do all they can to minimise these delays, recognising the needs of the donor and their family at this time. This is particularly important in circumstances when it is proposed to delay the withdrawal until the recipients of 
particularly vulnerable organs such as liver, pancreas and lungs have been identified and admitted to the transplant centers. Step 7. Withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Once the retrieval teams are set up in a vacant theatre and all involved parties are informed, the SNORTS will request this withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment to be performed by a donor hospital clinician. The treatment withdrawal for DCD donors in the UK is often carried out in the intensive care unit. Although many hospitals have a protocol to perform this in an anaesthetic room. Withdrawal of treatment in the operating theatre reduces the ischemic injury by avoiding the need to transfer a patient from a critical care area after the diagnosis of death. Units planning for withdrawal in operating theatre must have systems in place to ensure that a patient's right to comfort, dignity and privacy is guaranteed and that this care is being delivered by appropriately trained and experienced healthcare professionals. Similarly, it is vital that unlimited access for close family members, friends and those meeting the religious or spiritual needs of the patient is ensured. Within the UK, there are significant variations in how the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment is performed. Each institution should follow their local protocols. Importantly, Practice should not be altered because of the potential for organ donation. Infusions of sedative or opioid medications may be continued or commenced as appropriate in line with the local and national end-of-life care guidelines. Withdrawal will usually involve cessation of mechanical ventilation as well as any other forms of organ support. The endotracheal tubes of potential donors may be removed or left in place. If an endotracheal tube of a potential lung DC donor has been removed, reintubation and a recruitment maneuver will be required after the confirmation of death and prior to the organ donation. It is important that the SNOT documents the timing of withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment and the hemodynamic deterioration to allow clear communication of the onset of functional warm ischemic time to the retrieval and the transplantation teams. Step 8. Diagnosis of circulatory death. Circulatory death is defined as an irreversible cessation of circulatory function. The individual should be observed by the medical practitioner confirming death for a minimum of 5 minutes to establish that irreversible cardiorespiratory arrest has occurred. Five minutes of continuous asystole is sufficient to ensure that both consciousness and the respiration have ceased and also that the possibility for spontaneous resumption of the circulation has passed. DCD requires that death is declared at the earliest possible time after the circulatory arrest that is scientifically ethically and professionally acceptable to minimize the warm ischemic time. Absence of mechanical cardiac function is normally confirmed using a combination of the following. Absence of a central pulse on palpation, absence of heart sounds on auscultation, asystole on a continuous ECG display, absence of pulsatile flow if using direct intra-arterial pressure monitoring. Observe for a minimum of 5 minutes to establish that irreversible cardiorespiratory arrest has occurred. Any spontaneous return of cardiac or respiratory activity during this period of observation should prompt a further 5 minutes of observation from the next point of cardiorespiratory arrest. After 5 minutes of continued cardiorespiratory arrest, the absence of pupillary response to light and corneal reflexes together with absence of any motor response to supraorbital pressure should be confirmed. The time of death is recorded as the time at which these criteria are fulfilled. Step 9. Arrangements for transfer to the operating theatre. During the consent process, it should be clearly explained to families 
that after confirmation of death, the disease will remain in the intensive care unit or anesthetic room for five minutes only prior to transfer to the theatres. The family may wish to remain with the deceased for this period of time. Following the diagnosis and confirmation of death, that the deceased should be transferred to the theatre in a swift, dignified manner so as to minimize warm ischemia. The disease will be accompanied by the SNOD and a member of the intensive care team. The SNOD is responsible for coordinating the safe transfer of the patient to the operating table, completion of the WHO checklist, documentation and, com and communication of the key timings. Step 10. Organ Retrieval and End-of-Life Care The attending organ retrieval team performs the retrieval operation. A thorough in-situ assessment is performed by surgeons prior to the organ retrieval. Following the end of the organ retrieval process, care after death is performed by the snod in keeping with the religious and cultural practices of the deceased. Post-donation, the snod will contact the donor family to offer both additional support and information about the outcome of the donation. In summary, although often very emotive and resource intense, the organ donation process frequently offers the opportunity for a much improved quality of life for recipients and a long-term comfort for donor families. Communication, multidisciplinary working, structured identification, and referral process are all crucial in the provision of high quality organ donation services.